And I have a couple of uh, announcements. Um, um, first off, uh, welcome everybody. Um, Happy New Year. I'm looking forward to a uh, very different uh, and uh, more, more pleasant and healthy 2021. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, first, our kudos. And the first one is from uh, Garrett Davis, who is an emergency medicine resident at Madigan Army Medical Center. And Garrett um, sent a very nice note thanking Madeline Jackson for the great care uh, she provided when Dr. Davis's uh, mother um, fractured her ankle and was um, treated at um, UW. So thank you for that, Dr. Jackson. And the second kudo of the month um, is from Dr. Jeff Friedrich, our own Dr. Friedrich, who also sent a very um, nice note um, thanking um, Akam Dillon and Alex Higgins uh, for taking excellent care of um, one of Dr. Friedrich's children when they broke their distal radius and ulnar while they were snowboarding. Um, so um, thank you, Dr. Dillon and Dr. Higgins. Um, Aaron, do you, um, can you project um, that um, slide for me? So before we get uh, started with Grand Rounds, I, I just wanted to um, congratulate Drs. Walker and Dr. Taylor uh, for what I think is a really powerful uh, position piece that was pub just published. I think it's just coming out in um, uh, the paper version of the journal um, on uh, our collective responsibility to dismantle uh, systemic racism. Uh, I'm grateful that they included me in this. They did the heavy lifting. And I can tell you that um, we've been immersed in this uh, quite a bit, particularly in the School of Medicine and the University of Washington. And yet I was able to still learn a lot um, from um, working with uh, Mario and Greg. Um, I don't know if it's um, just fortuitous or whether things are actually changing, but it's striking to me that um, purely coincidentally, I was intending to project this this morning, uh, and I think everybody is aware of the um, somewhat astounding um, results in the uh, Georgia election um, with the first African American uh, to be a senator from Georgia. So um, I would just leave you uh, with that. Our, our residents, I think our children uh, have this figured out. And as I learned from helping prepare this editorial, all we really need to do is um, follow in their coattails. Uh, and I think things will really uh, be different and better uh, for us. So I, I am going to send out a, a link to this. And again, congratulations to Mario and Greg. It was uh, an amazing, this, as you might imagine, was a little bit controversial uh, for the journal. And uh, it underwent uh, a remarkable number of very thoughtful uh, revisions. And so with that, um, we'll uh, begin Grand Rounds. I'm Howard Chansky. I'm the chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. And this morning, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Corey Schiffman, who is one of our fourth year uh, stellar residents and Dr. Jonah Abair Davies, um, who is one of our trauma faculty uh, based at Harborview. And they are going to talk this morning about the management of proximal humerus fractures. So, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chansky. Good morning. My name is Corey Schiffman. I'm a fourth year resident at the University of Washington. Today, Dr. Davies and I will be speaking about proximal humerus fractures in 2021, indications and technical pearls for reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. I have nothing to disclose. So we'll begin with an introduction followed by the anatomy of the proximal humerus. We'll discuss two different classification systems followed by imaging, and then we'll discuss some treatment options for proximal humerus fractures. 
Proximal humerus fractures are the third most common fracture after hip fractures and distal radius fractures. And they make up roughly 6% of fractures. And they have a bimodal distribution and are, are common in the elderly population due to osteoporosis. And they tend to occur after low energy mechanisms. In the younger population, they tend to occur after high energy mechanisms. The humeral head neck angle has an average of 135 degrees and the proximal humerus is retroverted on average 30 degrees, but it's been found to be variable. The osteology can be broken down into four parts with the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor attaching to the greater tuberosity, the subscapularis attaching to the lesser tuberosity, and the pectoralis major attaching to the shaft and this is important because they're responsible for the deforming forces following proximal humerus fracture. The main blood supply to the proximal humerus has been found to be the posterior humeral circumflex artery. However, there is significant contributions from the anterior humeral circumflex artery and more minor contributions from the perforating vessels from the rotator cuff. In a landmark study by Hurdle et al., they evaluated the predictors of ischemia after proximal humerus fractures. The significant predictors that they found include metaphyseal head extension less than eight millimeters, loss of the medial hinge, and increasing complexity of the fracture or fracture of the anatomical neck. The first classification that we'll discuss is the near classification, which is the, the most commonly used classification and it breaks the fracture fragments down into parts. In order to be considered a part, the fragment needs to be displaced greater than one centimeter and angulated greater than 45 degrees. And while this classification has been found to have only moderate inter-observer reliability, it's still useful in terms of communication, predicting prognosis, and helping to determine the treatment strategy. There's also an OTA classification, which breaks down the fractures into extra-articular versus intra-articular and unifocal versus bifocal. When working up a patient with a proximal humerus fracture, it's important to start with good radiographs, including the Grashi and the scapular Y view. However, it's also important to get good axial imaging to evaluate for glenohumeral dislocation and gain more information on the tuberosities. And this can be achieved either through the axillary view or the Valpo view. And in the setting of a proximal humerus fracture, the Valpo view has the benefit of requiring less motion through the fracture, putting the fracture at less risk of further displacement and putting the patient through less pain. CT scan is beneficial when the axial radiographs are suboptimal and it can also help improve the understanding of a complex fracture evaluate for an associated injury, such as a glenoid fracture, and can also be helpful when preoperative planning. The first treatment option we'll discuss is non-surgical treatment, which can be indicated in patients with less complex fractures, fractures that are minimally displaced, valgus impacted, fractures of the greater tuberosity with displacement less than five millimeters, but most importantly, considering patient factors. For example, a patient who has multiple medical comorbidities and a lower functional demand might be a patient that's worth considering non-surgical treatment on. And when doing non-operative treatment, you begin with short-term immobilization followed by early mobilization to decrease the risk of stiffness. A commonly discussed article when considering surgical versus non-surgical treatment is the PROFER trial which was a large multi-center randomized control trial that included 250 patients that were randomized to either non-operative versus operative treatment. Their primary outcome measure was the Oxford shoulder score, which is a patient reported functional outcome score. And what they found was that there was no difference at six, 12 and 24 months. However, only 20% of the initially evaluated patients were included in the study. And they excluded 87 patients with a clear indication of surgery, likely introducing a selection bias that would benefit the non-surgical group. 
So it's important to keep this in mind when interpreting the results and conclusions of this study. Next, we'll discuss closed reduction in percutaneous pinning, which can be indicated in fractures when you're able to gain an acceptable closed reduction, adequate bone stock, there's minimal comminution, an intact medial calcar, and in a medically frail patient that might otherwise not be able to tolerate a more invasive procedure. When performing a CRPP, it's important to know your anatomy well, um, most notably the anatomy of the axillary nerve, which courses through the deltoid roughly six centimeters distal to the inferior edge of the lateral acromion, but also the musculocutaneous nerve, cephalic vein, biceps tendon, and articular cartilage. And in a study by Rolls et al. published in JBJS, they recommend your retrograde pins entering the lateral cortex a distance twice of the humeral head in order to avoid injury to the deltoid nerve as it courses through the deltoid. I'm sorry, the axillary nerve as it courses through the deltoid and your anterior gray pin exiting the medial cortex greater than two centimeters distal to the inferior margin of the articular surface. Pins are typically removed four to six weeks after the surgery. And it's also important for the surgeon to be aware that there's an increased complication rate compared to open reduction and internal fixation with complications including superficial infection, hardware failure, malunion, and neurologic injury. This brings us to discuss open reduction and internal fixation, which is indicated in younger patients with more displaced fractures or simple fractures in the elderly. A fixed angle locking plate is typically used as it helps prevent varus deformity and can improve fixation in cancellous bone. And this can be achieved either through the deltopectoral or the deltoid splitting approach. The deltopectoral approach has the advantages of it being more frequently used and taught. It's more extensile. However, it's more difficult to access the greater tuberosity and the anterior circumflex vessels are at increased risk, which as we discussed is an important contributor to the blood supply of the proximal humerus. The deltoid split has the benefits of improved access to the greater tuberosity, as well as having improved lateral plate positioning. However, the axillary nerve, as we discussed, is placed at increased risk, and it's more difficult to access the anteromedial aspect. At the end of the day, the approach comes down to surgeon preference. While the deltopectoral approach is a gold standard, the deltoid split is helpful for some fractures, such as isolated greater tuberosity fractures and valgus two or three part fractures. It's also important to recognize medial calcar bone loss because it can lead to an increased risk of failure into varus. Um, therefore, it's, a, it's good to know the different augmentation options that can be used to increase the inherent stability in your construct. This, this radiograph shows the use of the fibular allograph, allograph strut, caged implant, and calcium-containing bone substitute. Next, we'll discuss hemiarthroplasty, which is indicated in younger patients with fractures with increased risk of failure or going on to osteonecrosis after open reduction and internal fixation. It's important that the rotator cuff is, is intact and still attached to the tuberosities. The outcomes following hemiarthroplasty are associated with restoring the anatomy of the proximal humerus most notably the position and healing of the tuberosities, but also proper humeral height and version. This image on the left demonstrates a malunited greater tuberosity, which is causing impingement in external rotation. The image on the right shows the important landmark of the pectoralis major insertion with the goal of having the superior aspect of your humeral component roughly 5.6 centimeters superior to the insertion of the pec major tendon. And lastly, I wanted to introduce the topic of reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, which is indicated for older patients who have fractures with increased displacement and increased non-union risk, who have lower functional demand, but also a lower fall risk. 
And with that, I'd like to pass the discussion to Dr. Davies, who will go into uh, more depth regarding reverse total shoulder arthroplasty for proximal humerus fractures. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. That was really good. Uh, good review. I'm just going to uh, load this up here. All right. So, um, Corey wanted to talk about the place of reversal or arthroplasty in fractures. And I think it's something uh, that as a sort of dual uh, trained or dual uh, hat surgeon, uh, both shoulder and elbow and, and uh, trauma, I have to deal with a lot. And oftentimes we have to defend uh, the position of this uh, surgery because of sort of it being a newer thing or newer now, maybe less now, but, but before and uh, seeing if it's really worth the investment. So hopefully um, we'll be able to get through that. And I don't have any relevant disclosures for this talk. And, you know, really the objectives of this talk are going to be to talk about uh, the place of reverse shoulder in uh, proximal humerus fractures and, and look at all the current literature, really going to try to sort through it and avoid all the fake news that's out there. Um, and then for the residents, I'll talk a little bit about tips and tricks for how to do reverse shoulder for fracture. And hopefully, you know, the, the holiday season just passing by, we'll be able to untangle the mess and have uh, have something like this. So that was a really good review uh, uh, that uh, Corey did about sort of talking about the different uh, background stuff for the proximal humerus. And the biggest thing that I would say uh, is, is, you know, there are very different fracture patterns and different uh, patients, right? And so this fracture in this type of patient is a totally different animal than this fracture in this patient. And one of the most important things we can do is really adapt our treatments uh, to these specific patients and to their demands. The problem is, you know, usually what we do for evidence-based medicine is, is apply the current literature and just do that. Uh, and that's what we think, you know, our, our best guess of the, the right treatment is. And then when the literature changes, uh, we change our, our practice. But the problem with proximal humerus is really there's a rapidly evolving literature. And then the other problem is, just like you saw, it's a really heterogeneous population. To get any type of, of conclusion, we need really large cohorts. And sometimes in the middle of studies, you know, technology changes. And so what was once published is maybe no longer applicable. So we'll try to sort through that. But Going through literature of proximal humerus fractures in the past you know, five years, you cannot get away from talking a little bit about the PROFER study. And this is a large study that was done uh, based out of uh, the UK. Um, and just like Corey talked about, they found no difference in treatment between operative and non-operative. And you know, we, could, we talked a little bit about how, much were pa or how many patients were excluded, but one of the biggest things is they excluded patients that were that had a clear indication for surgery. And, and, and that determination was made by the surgeon. And, you know, so the question is how representative is that, right? But the problem, when you look at the impact of this study is it has changed practice for a lot of people. And so a survey uh, that came out last uh, two years ago looked at, uh, you know, ha have people's practice changed with regards to non-operative treatment? And the answer is yes. And so the other problem I have with the PROFER study is, you know, this, the fracture on the left really isn't the same as the fracture on the right. But in the PROFER study, there's really no difference because they had, they included all comers, uh, whether people thought they were uh, surgical or not, unless they were excluded. So, you know, a meta-analysis that came out last year tried to sort out through some of these things, and they really separated out the three-part and the four-part proximal humerus fractures. And they did a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, which is um, a very statistical thing, but basically looked at uh, open reduction toe fixation versus non-operative treatment for these three and four part fractures. And you know, obviously they didn't include the PROFER study in this meta-analysis, but what they found was for these more displaced, more comminuted fractures, there was a better outcome uh, with surgery. However, there were higher risk of complications, which is, is fairly obvious. Um, you know, the, the one thing that's important is that when we do surgery, we have to remember this is not harmless, right? There, there, there are a significant amount of complications. We have gotten better at this surgery, but uh, there's still about an 11% uh, risk of non-union fracture fixation, AVN. And when they, uh, the group out of Scotland looked at their long-term results at 10 years, they had about 74% uh, survival free from reoperation. 
So that means that 26% of patients uh, were revised. And that's, that's a pretty high number when you look at it. So obviously these are not, uh, uh, so, sorry, open reduction to fixation is not free from complications. Well, what about hemiarthroplasty? That's been used for a long time for these four part fractures in older patients. And I think, you know, we'll see later on in the literature, but for me, this has gone down as far as the indication, maybe uh, slightly younger patients that have higher demands, but that have uh, very bad joint injuries uh, would be the, the sort of the primary indication. The problem with hemiarthroplasty, as we know, is that the function and the outcomes are totally related to healing of the tuberosities. And that would be great if we had a really good way to heal, to, to, to reliably get these to heal. The problem is even in the best studies, uh, the range is anywhere from 30 to 90% uh, healing rate. And so if these don't heal, while they do provide good pain, uh, um, you know, good pain uh, function or good, good pain reduction, they really don't have good function. And, and so that's really a less than ideal outcome. When we look at the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, you know, I think we're approaching about the 20 year mark of when it was released in the, in the US. Um, it's been around a little bit longer in, in Europe, but Really, this was designed to uh, treat the cuff tear arthropathy, right? The patient that had no rotator cuff, that had no really good arthroplasty option. And, um, you know, the, how it works is really by changing the center of rotation and changing the primary motor of the shoulder from the rotator cuff to the deltoid. And, and truly, in shoulder surgery, this has been the biggest change uh, in outcomes and the biggest uh, impact on patient uh, um, uh, outcomes for arthritis. And so, you know, people started thinking, well, tuberosity non-union is very similar to what cuff to arthropathy looks like. And so maybe we could start using these for fracture. And so we already know that arthroplasty is good for treating pain, but, you know, maybe this could give our patients more function and uh, more reliable outcomes. And it is an expensive uh, thing. You know, this, just like the, the car on the right here is just, uh, when it came out, it's very ex expensive, but if it gives you good function, maybe that's worth the, the, the cost. And, you know, this surgery is sort of meant to think that everything goes well. It's sort of on autopilot, but we know that things don't always go well. And so sometimes, you know, we want to avoid this type of situation. So what I thought I'd do was to give us a sort of an objective look at data, right? Everybody talks about data, 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 big data. We want to make sure we get everything right. And I've kind of put together the different studies and, and, and I hope to kind of convince people that this is the right uh, surgery to do. So the first thing that I want to look at is, you know, we know we do reverse shoulder arthroplasty for cuff tear arthropathy, but do they do as well when we do them for fracture? And so here's a study that looked at, um, at comparing both of these uh, different types of operations. And what they found is, although the fracture group patients were older, at one year, there really was no difference in outcomes. And the complication rate was not statistically different, actually lower in the fracture group, but not statistically different. So we know that at one year, they're about the same. And then here's another study that followed these patients over a longer period of time. And so at eight, uh, over, greater than eight years mean follow-up, they really found no difference in outcome. And they also found an excellent survivorship of the implant, right? So you're looking at 97% survivorship in, in both groups at eight years and really no different. So I know there hasn't been a lot of sports uh, this year. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd try to kind of keep score for us. So if we're looking at this proximal humerus fractures, the first thing is, you know, uh, reverse shoulder for fracture seems to be equivalent in outcomes uh, than reverse shoulder for arthritis. The next thing to look at is really Proximal humerus fractures are increasing. We see more of them. We're seeing more of them. It's not just a feeling. It really is ref reflected in the incidence rate. And so this is a study from Australia, but the rates are similar in the U.S. and the increases are similar. And what we've seen is uh, a jump in the past 10 years. And, and this is reflected also in, you know, a treatment uh, that is, is more non-operative as things have, have been, uh, changed over the past few years. But along with that is we've seen that there's been a huge increase in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty used as a primary treatment. And so uh, this has been mostly at the expense of hemiarthroplasty, but also a little bit at the expense of uh, open reduction tone fixation, right? Uh, 
And so when we look at this and we look at the patients that are getting this, we have to think, is this, you know, is this a good investment? Or are we doing the right thing for these patients? And so when you look at the uh, mortality rate and the epidemiology of uh, fractures in uh, older patients, you know, these are an, a, a much or an older group uh, as a whole than those getting it for arthroplast uh, for arthritis. Uh, but patient survival is, is quite high. You know, you look at these patients and they're not necessarily a, a, a marker of comorbidity like it is in hip fractures, right? And so at one year, you have very high survival rate, which kind of uh, maintains itself over five and even 19 years. And you compare that to hip fractures uh, where, you know, 80% to, to 75% at, uh, survivor uh, at one year, you're really talking about a different animal. And so while the incidence is increasing uh, in proximal humerus fracture, patient survival is higher than in, in something like hip fractures. It really means that we have to have something that is a, a good uh, treatment option for these patients because uh, they will be uh, living longer and they will be, you know, there will be more of them over the next few years. So why don't we start by looking at uh, open reduction internal fixation. And so when we compare, uh, or sorry, a recent um, uh, randomized control trial looked at open reduction internal fixation uh, versus um, arthroplasty. And what they found was there really was no uh, difference in outcomes. There was much, or there was slightly better range of motion uh, overall for open reduction internal fixation, but this didn't maintain itself within the functional outcome scores. But what they did find was there was a greater risk of complications and a greater risk of revision surgery in the um, open reduction internal fixation group. Another study that came out in JBGS uh, in this past year uh, kind of did the same um, study design. And what they found was not only did reverse shoulder arthroplasty have better function, which was in the, in the outcome scores, but the four part fractures, so the, the, the more complex fractures, the more displaced fractures, uh, seem to do better with reverse shoulder than the three-part fractures compared to operative fixation. And again, the thing that they found were the, the, there was less complications and less revisions for uh, shoulder arthroplasty. Now, this is a two-year study or two-year outcome study, and we don't know how long these will last, but for at least in the early period, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty seems to be a better option than, um, than open reduction to fixation. So we'll add to the scoreboard here and we'll, we'll increase uh, the points for uh, reverse shoulder. All right, so the next thing that we uh, will look at, you know, hemiarthroplasty has been used for a long time uh, as a primary treatment for these uh, types of fractures in older patients. And what we know is, like I saw, I talked a little bit about earlier, the tuberosity healing really is the key uh, to um, to the outcomes or to getting good outcomes. The problem is, you know, this tuberosity healing, despite all different techniques that have been described, despite different or improved technology, we still aren't able to get a reliably uh, good re uh, result with healing that is sort of applicable to all patients and surgeons. So um, a recent study that was published in the journal Shoulder and Elbow looked at a multi-center uh, randomized control trial. And what they found was that uh, patients with the reverse shoulder arthroplasty had better range of motion, improved outcomes, and also improved patient satisfaction compared to hemiarthroplasty. And so when you look at this in a large uh, registry, so um, Australian arthroplasty registry is excellent with regards to data collection for hip and knee, but also for shoulder. And they uh, released their data from the past um, 10 years uh, last year. And I was at a meeting where they really uh, go, you know, looked at all of the, the different um, uh, parameters. And what they found was when comparing uh, RSA for fracture uh, to hemiarthroplasty, uh, they really had had a better, out, or sorry, a lower revision rate with reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And you know, this is at seven years uh, because this is sort of the newer data uh, but they're obviously going to continue to look at this. And the one thing that came out of this study was there was a slightly higher risk for revision for men and for patients that are under the age of 65 um, uh, for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So that's something to remember, and we'll come back to it in just a little bit.
Here's a meta-analysis that came out in 2018 that included 22 different studies. And since 2018, another sort of five to six randomized control trials have come out uh, looking at this question. So like I said, there's a lot of literature, but this meta-analysis really found that reversal arthroplasty uh, maintained better outcomes across the board and was actually a more reproducible outcome with the confidence intervals being much tighter compared to hemiarthroplasty. The, the patients tended to have better forward elevation uh, with range of motion. And the hemi, but that being said, hemiarthroplasty uh, had better external and internal rotation when tuberosities healed. And so although reverse shoulder was overall better, there's still some advantage to a well done hemiarthroplasty. The problem is when the uh, outcomes or the, the, you know, the healing rate is so variable, maybe at that point, it's better to do a, a reverse shoulder arthroplasty and give the patients a more uh, reliable uh, treatment. So keeping score again, we now add a point, right? The outcomes for uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty are better than they are for uh, hemiarthroplasty overall. All right, so now we, we know that, uh, that RSA is better than open reduction tone fixation or at least it has less complications and uh, less revision rate. It tends to have better outcomes than hemiarthroplasty. And overall, they tend to have good outcomes uh, just as the, uh, the ones done for, arth for uh, arthritis are. The question that it comes up all the time, and this is something that you know, comes up even in the, um, in the editorial comment in that RCT uh, in JBJS was, you know, does this last? Do we, you know, we're doing this fancy new surgery and at two years, it all looks great. But if everything falls apart at five years, then we've put a very expensive implant, uh, mobilized a lot of, of resources, and it hasn't lasted. And so one of the things that uh, a lot of these newer studies are looking at is what is the, the longevity of this uh, surgery? And so here is the uh, Scandinavian uh, registry. So this is from uh, Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And what they found uh, was, uh, you know, with a fairly large number of shoulder arthroplasties done for acute proximal humerus fractures, the five-year implant survival was 97%, uh, which is extremely high and, and sort of exactly what you would want. And again, what they found were men and patients under 60 uh, had slightly higher revision rate. So something to think about when we're doing these or indicating these patients are, are higher demand patients, maybe... Um, thinking about, you know, this might not be the optimal treatment for them, but, uh, but still, or at least warning them of the, the slightly higher uh, revision rate. A uh, French study that looked, uh, this is a slightly older study because the uh, arthroplasty or reverse shoulder arthroplasty was first uh, utilized in France, um, but they, they have a much longer follow-up. And so in 2019, they sort of published this very large case series, 400 cases, uh, that found that, you know, most of their patients did well to very well, and uh, they had a fairly low complication rate. And we'll come back to that because it's important. But most stunningly, they had 91% of patients were free from reoperations at 20 years. And so this is really important data because it, it probably shows that just like most arthroplasty, once you get over the initial wear-in or the, the initial complications of infection and whatnot, these are fairly um, durable implants and durable surgery, and that can provide sort of lasting outcomes for patient. And you know this this has an effect on our cost benefit, right? And so um, we know that the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, at least the implants themselves, uh, have about a three to five times the cost of the hemiarthroplasty implant. Now, obviously, it depends on the company, depends on the on the hospital but it's not negligible as far as the cost difference. And so a Canadian study looked at the cost uh, utility or cost benefit, creating a model and did an analysis. And what they found was that incrementally, uh, the, shoulder, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty fracture was cost effective uh, per quality adjusted life year uh, increased. And that it was about three times under the threshold of what is generally accepted in the literature. And not only did they find this, but they found that these results were maintained to about a 15% complication rate. And so patients uh, will continue to benefit from this surgery, at least from a cost standpoint, uh, 
if surgeons are able to keep their complication rate under 15%, which is fairly high. And as we saw in the previous study, uh, you know, the, the, a very large study had about a 12% complication rate. And these are with older implants and older technology. So I think, you know, when we're looking at keeping score, uh, we, we have a couple more things to notch onto the uh, proximal humerus, uh, sorry, onto the reverse shoulder arthroplasty side. You know, one, the implant survival is very high and it lasts a long time, potentially more than 20 years if 90% survivorship at 20 years is there. And also it's a very cost effective, or at least it, it is a cost effective uh, surgery as long as we maintain complications low. And this is a big deal because initially when the first studies came out uh, of reverse shoulder arthroplasty for fracture in the US, you know, a lot of the case series had a very high complication rate up to about 25%. But over time, those have been coming way down. And I think what you see now is probably more around the 10% 10 or less and this is uh, using a very wide definition of complications. And so in most experienced hands, I would say that this surgery is, is, is probably uh, very cost effective. All right, so how do we make this even better, right? We know it's cost effective. We know that patients do well, but are there ways that we can uh, get even better results, right? Because we, we want to have not just a, a good result, but we really want to get an extremely good result. And so how we do that? Well, one of the things that is a big debate, but uh, seems to have been settled over the past several years is what do we do with the tuberosities, right? We know that they don't need to heal um, for a reverse shoulder uh, arthroplasty to work, just like the uh, cuff tear arthropathy. But what if we get them to heal, right? We know that the bony surfaces are probably easy to, easier to heal than the rotator cuff itself. And so if we do a really good uh, job at stabilizing them and get them to heal, you know, there's a study here that showed they had about 75% uh, healing rate. And when they broke down the groups between those that healed and those that didn't, you know, you can see a much improved forward elevation, much improved external and internal rotation. And this is at two years, right? And so, uh, another study that came out really looked at this as well, and, and they repaired all the tuberosities, and they found about, again, a 75% healing rate. And this is a lot higher for whatever reason than, um, than hemiarthroplasty. But again, if the tuberosities heal, just like in hemiarthroplasty, patients get better function and they get better external rotation, but also forward elevation. And both of those things have a huge impact on patient outcomes. And so uh, when doing reverse shoulder arthroplasty, I think it's important to try to get the tuberosities to heal and taking the slightly uh, increased surgical time and effort uh, required to get to, to get good tuberosity fixation and getting them to heal. So keeping score again, we know that if you, if you try to, to fix the tuberosities and get them to heal, patients will do better, okay? Well, what else can we do to do better? One of the things I hear often is, um, you know, either another surgeon calls me or a transfer center call or, or one of my colleagues is, you know, there's a patient who has this displaced fracture, but they're, they're old and they may be sort of not that functional. And why don't we just try to treat them non-operatively? And, you know, if it doesn't work, you can always do a shoulder arthroplasty. And while that's true, um, you know, I would caution that the, the, the reasoning behind that is, is to maybe not have to do a uh, quote unquote useless uh, reverse uh, shoulder arthroplasty uh, and to you know, decrease the number needed to treat. But it is fairly easier to do these technically uh, acutely. And as you'll see, you know, the, the Danish uh, uh, shoulder arthroplasty registry looked at this and what they found is when, when arthroplasty was done for proximal humerus fractures treated non-operatively that were uh, dissatisfied with their outcome, the complication weight rate went way up. And so in that, in this specific registry, they had 11% revision at only 3.7 years, which is really, really high. Uh, and not at all what we see with the acute fractures, uh, that were in the previous, um, in the previous studies. The other things they found were that patients had much poorer outcomes than primary reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So I would caution although we want to avoid the patient that has a needless uh, arthroplasty, uh, 
you know, the problem is those that need it uh, would do better with having it earlier rather than, than later. And so when we look at operative fixation, this, the same kind of holds true with that, right? So oftentimes people say, well, why don't I just fix it? And if it doesn't go well, you can revise it and do a, a reverse shoulder arthroplasty for it. The problem is, as this uh, study showed, is you know there's a very high complication rate for those revision surgeries. And also the, the clinical outcomes are worse than when these are done primarily. And so these two studies came out this, this year, but several other studies in the past have also looked at this. And again, time and time again, they found that complications are lower, incomes, uh, outcomes are improved, and the op reoperation rate is lower when you do these acutely. And so what I'd say is, although we'd like to kind of, uh, we all, or we've all, we've all treated uh, fractures non-operatively and seen some weird x-rays where we think there's no way this can go well and patients come back with full range of motion and, and no pain, I would say, you know, the likelihood of these very displaced fractures uh, doing well is probably lower than we think. And when, if you're going to do surgery, kind of maybe look at the patient, look at their demands. And if they're relatively, you know, high or, or, you know, functional, then maybe doing a reversal of FLC early is probably a better, a better idea. So, you know, I think the final score shows that proximal, uh, for proximal humerus fractures in patients above the age of 60, reverse shoulder arthroplasty is an excellent option, right? It provides really good functional outcome that's equal to that for primary um, arthritis. We know that they're long lasting. We think maybe 70 to 90% survival at up to 20 years, which means that in a lot of these patients, these implants could potentially last their whole life or more. Um, that the, the, the implant itself or the surgery itself is cost effective if you maintain complications low. And you know, these are better done acutely. And if you look at some a few, you know, technical pearls such as repairing the tuberosities or getting really good at doing these and proficient, then I think we can improve uh, results. And so, you know, I think when you look objectively at the data, the data is pushing more and more into reverse shoulder arthroplasty as a primary um, treatment for these higher demand, maybe not super high demand, but higher demand uh, uh, patients above the age of 60. And uh, I think, you know, although not conclusive, it, it really is pushing us in that direction. And so I thought, and I, I apologize for the faculty, but I thought maybe for the residents, uh, we could go over some of the things, you know, or some of my tips for how to do this, because uh, we'll go on to do sports uh, fellowships and to do trauma fellowships and to do shoulder and elbow fellowships, but you'll probably end up doing uh, some of these uh, more and more. And you really want to get good at them so that you're you are able to maintain your complication rate rather low. And so, you know, if you look at the brochures from the companies, this looks really easy. Just put the, you know, step one, do this, step two, do that. And, you know, next thing, you know, patients come back with full range of motion. But in practice, it's not so easy. And so I thought I'd give you guys a couple of tips and tricks of how to uh, get get good outcomes or, or, or have the surgery go well. And so it starts with, Preoperative planning, uh, positioning, uh, looking at the approach, little tips on glenoid exposure uh, and stem placement, and then finally tuberosity uh, fixation. And so the first thing uh, that uh, you can do is, you know, really collect all of the available information. Look at the x-rays, study the x-rays. Look, is there metaphyseal bone loss? Is there a huge amount of neck uh, missing that I won't be able to uh, uh, get a stem to uh, impact there, right? Look at the stem width. Is this a stovepipe type humerus? Am I going to have to cement this? Uh, all of these things uh, are easy to see on the x-ray. You can look at the glenoid morphology. Is there an associated glenoid fracture? The other thing is I get, I usually get CT scans and, and this can give you a lot of information as well, right? What is the tuberosity uh, degree of comminution? Am I going to be able to maybe plate the tuberosity around the fracture or around the stem? Or am I going to have to uh, just suture it? Uh, you know, is there an associated dislocation? Am I worried about glenoid fracture that I won't have enough room to place my base plate? The other thing is look at the glenoid anatomy, look at the version, right? This gives you an idea of how you're gonna position your definitive implant. Look at the width of the glenoid um, because the base plates come in different sizes. You really wanna 
not have any surprises intraoperatively. And so glenoid version, you know, in the liter in the literature is anywhere from you know minus 15 degrees to five degrees in the normal shoulder. And really what you're trying to do is keep it neutral. So if you see on your preoperative CT scan that you have something in the you know plus or minus five degrees, then probably just match the glenoid version to what you see and you'll be fine. Um, Ideally, if you have a very dysplastic glenoid, you want to correct it to as close to neutral as possible, but really don't try to correct it to more, uh, more than 10 degrees or, or, or there'll be significant bone uh, loss uh, there. Oops. All right, so the next thing is in positioning. So we uh, position these in beach chair and the, you know, the thing with beach chair is the more incline you put, usually the better visualization you get, soft tissue kind of falls away from from the glenoid and from the proximal aspect of the humerus. But the problem is, you know, the more you sit these patients up, the higher risk they have. And so I think you have to look at that uh, objectively with the anesthesiologist and think about how to keep their pressure high enough to maintain brain perfusion, but also sort of play in the sweet spot between uh, better visualization and, and, and not a lot of increased risk. The one thing you can do is bring the patient over to the side of the table as much as possible and what that does is sort of clears the arm um, as much as you can so that you can get better uh, access to the, uh, to the glenoid. Now you see, we use these the type of uh, uh, beach chair positioners often. And when you're doing a arthroscopy, you wanna move the uh, posterior support over as much as possible to clear the posterior aspect of the, 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 the scapula to allow for you to manipulate the camera. But I would suggest when doing uh, arthroplasty, you actually keep that underneath the scapula so that you can have something to lever against and stabilize the scapula. The other thing is you really wanna make sure the head, although it is neutral to not cause any neck uh, injury or C-spine injury, you wanna make sure that it's slightly tilted away from the body so that as you're reaming the humerus, uh, you don't uh, impinge or, or um, uh, come into contact with the patient's head. Finally, you know, I think when positioning, I use an arm positioner. You could also use an, a Mayo stand very uh, uh, effectively, but allow uh, use something that both supports the, the arm and allows you to get full range of motion to test the stability, test the range of motion, and make sure that you're really uh, happy with the, the surgery before you leave the OR. Finally, a lot of these tables have kidney supports, which are great for keeping patients on the table, but in the smaller patients, they can prevent a deduction. And so you really want to make sure that the patient can get their arm all the way over uh, a deducted so that you can uh, ream the humerus properly. And if not, you might want to take that kidney support off and, and supplement either with a seatbelt or with taping the patient over uh, to make sure that you're not um, going to impede your, uh, your surgery. Uh, with regards to the approach, uh, Corey talked a little bit about doing a deltopec versus deltoid split for fixation. I would say for the arthroplasty, the workhorse for most people is a uh, deltopectoral approach. Uh, I make some small revisions to it. So here's sort of a standard approach. Uh, I tend to make the approach slightly or start it slightly more medial uh, on the medial side of the coracoid, extend it slightly more lateral. This gives you a better angle to, do, to clear the deltoid out of the way. I'll release about a, a centimeter of pectoralis uh, major, obviously perform a biceps tenotomy or tenodesis, uh, but getting the, delta, the biceps out of the way. And then I'll use a deltoid brown retractor. Uh, even if it's fractured, I think you're able to uh, dislocate the humerus that way. Sometimes it doesn't respond as well, but you can move that retractor more distally and still uh, expose the, um, the humerus nicely. I do release the corticoacromial ligament in all these. And I know Dr. Matson. Uh, doesn't necessarily agree, but I think if you're doing these, especially if you haven't done a lot and you're doing a reverse, uh, you know, it helps with visualization, it helps with mobilization. And if uh, you're not planning on uh, revising these to a, a hemiarthroplasty, then it's probably uh, just fine. Um, you know, the good thing about the glenoid exposure is usually it's the hardest part when you have a, a humeral head fracture. Uh, you're able to remove the entire humeral head. So it does make glenoid exposure easier. But I think if you take a couple of systematic approaches, you'll see that you get even better visualization. And, I and, and once you get good visualization, really it's, it becomes a much simpler and much more reproducible surgery, even for uh, people who have done less of them. So remove the humeral head, uh, and then I perform an anterior capsule release. So that means removing or releasing the capsule from the subscapularis and the MGHL anteriorly.
And then after palpating the axillary nerve, I'll release the inferior capsule both off the humerus and off of the glenoid. And as long as you're palpating the axillary nerve and protecting it, this is, is safe and, and really does help to get more mobile, uh, mobility of the humeral shaft and dislocate it posteriorly, which gives you a much better view and access to the glenoid. And then I take these bank art retractors and I, 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 I go, you know, put them around the humerus, kind of like this. Um, I push the tuberosity anteriorly and I really identify the inferior border of the glenoid because I want to make sure that I'm seeing that when I'm putting the base plate uh, relatively low uh, or near to that portion of it so that I'm not creating any uh, risk of notching. Uh, with regards to the uh, stem, you know, we talked a little bit about it, but you really want to make sure you're able to AD duct the arm over as much as possible, basically until it's stuck to the patient's body and that you extend the arm slightly. And then you can use retractors. Here I use Dara retractors, but you can also use the deltoid uh, retractor to kind of dislocate the humerus anterior. And if you place uh, certain things, like I, I usually put the uh, Bovi holster in a, in a position where I can clamp the uh, anterior retractor to it so that's holding. And this allows me to be, uh, to not have somebody holding it that might be in the way, but still have a really good access to it. And so, you know, I think when looking at humeral, the humeral shaft, if the metaphysis is present or if the you know, humeral neck is present, then I would say impact the stem to, down to the bone and this will give you a good stable base uh, to build up from. If it's not present, then I would say kind of impact it all the way down to the shaft until you get to a stable position. And if you think that this is, uh, that there's enough height in their buildup. So, right, we know that the, um, both the stem, the, the polyethylene and the, the, the platform or the, um, uh, in, in another type of prosthesis, the, the proximal portion of the, the stem can be built up to build, to uh, create some offset. Um, if you think you can build that up sufficiently to get a stable implant, then impact it down to the bone. Otherwise, you really have to start thinking about cementing the implant slightly proud uh, to give yourself enough uh, buildup because these don't come in sort of, you know, plus 15 centimeter uh, polyethylenes. And then, you know, ideally, you really just want to lengthen not more than two and a half centimeters compared to the contralateral side. And so this is where, you know, repairing the two porosities come in and uh, trying to give you more stability. And so, you know, when you're trialing stability, something that you can do, and if you're not sure, is, is get an intraoperative x-ray. What does it look like? Have I recreated Shenton's line adequately? Have I, you know, given, is, is the stem look like it's the right size so that it won't subside? And really what I do now is, is I impaction graft a little bit around the stem to give it some rotational stability. And what I found is you're able to you know, impact the stem, trial it, and really mobilize the whole uh, shoulder and be sure that this is the right implant and the right stem position uh, before you choose the definitive one. When I do cement, uh, I tend to use a, a very minimal amount of, of cement and sometimes combine it with partial uh, impaction grafting. So you can see here, this is not the sort of white out cement that we had been doing for uh, hips and stuff in the past. It's really to control rotation and to prevent subsidence because what you want is to make sure that the humeral stem isn't turning uh, or uh, sinking, which would change your stability uh, of the implant. Finally, we talked a lot about this, but fixing the tuberosities and, and repairing the tuberosities uh, is important. And I think a couple of tricks are one, use multiple sutures, three, four, five, six sutures sometimes uh, on the tuberosities and, and make sure you're not going through the bone, but rather at the bone tendon junction. And, and the, the reason why is that oftentimes in these patients, the bone is, is you know, quite poor quality. And if you put a stitch to that, it'll rip right through. The other problem people do sometimes is put it through the tendon more medially. And again, you know, patient's rotator cuff at that age is not necessarily uh, very strong. And what happens is it can rip through uh, to the bone tendon. And so if you're, you tie a, a knot really tightly through the tendon, but there, then it rips through, then it'll loosen. And what happens is instead of the tuberosity staying where it is, it'll uh, migrate proximally. And so one of the, uh, one of the uh, issues uh, or one of the trips is really to just get the, the, the bone tendon junction or the suture right at the bone tendon junction. 
And then I combine multiple vertical and horizontal sutures, meaning I have sutures going straight up and down from the, the uh, humerus to the uh, tendon and also from the tendon to the other tendon and to the stem itself. And if there's no contact between the stem and the tuberosities, then I do bone graft using the uh, humeral head, which you can kind of see uh, here. And so in summary, I think that the, the you know reverse shoulder arthroplasty is a complex surgery, but if you break it down and you take every single um, you know aspect of it, uh, you kind of you know go through it uh, sequentially using the several tips, you know positioning, uh, placement of retractors, and and really getting good exposure, uh, and more importantly, getting familiarity with it. I think it can be done uh, and and give a good outcome for almost uh, all er, almost everybody. And so in conclusion, I think that the reverse shoulder arthroplasty for proximal humerus is, is a reliable option for patients that are above the age of 60. I think it provides really good outcomes, both functionally and with range of motion and with patient satisfaction. Um, it has a relatively low revision rate when done by people or by surgeons that are experienced uh, in this surgery. Uh, the, the, the surgeon, the Implants tend to last a long time, and this makes them cost effective. And, you know, obviously, we think that they're better uh, when they're done acutely uh, and, and not done in a revision fashion. And, and, I'll, and I'll compare it to this car uh, that's in this image. And, you know, when this, these cars came out a few or so almost 10 years ago now, you know, pay, people said they're expensive. They're not a, uh, not a good investment. They won't last. They're sort of a novelty. And, uh, and, and if you look at how they've grown over the past 10 years, you know, the reliability factor, the safety factor, the outcomes, if you will, have really gotten a lot better or uh, have, have shown that they've lasted. And, you know, they have the number one satisfaction uh, for a lot of car owners. And so what I'll say is, you know, just because something is new and shiny and expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. And I think obviously we need better or to, to make sure the data over time supports this, but probably as we get better with surgery, this will be, uh, this will be maintained over time. Thanks. And thank you, Dr. Abir Davies and Dr. Schiffman. That was fantastic. I think uh, you both probably uh, convinced uh, most of us that that is the way to go for um, these fractures. There are a couple of um, comments and questions. Um, um, Dr. Matson, if everybody looks in their chat section, has uh, referred people to uh, an article on his shoulder uh, blog spot. And Dr. Kwan um, complimented your talk, said awesome talk. And he had a question about use of um, an application of a coaptation splint for initial management of these fractures. Um, Chris, do you have any, you want to just um, unmute and ask the details, mention the details of that question. Yeah, thanks. So really, really nice work, you guys. It was kind of, you know, um, just on proximal humerus fractures in general, I, I, I feel like there's a lot of pain involved in a coaptation splint, or at least the memories of that are still fresh as a resident, trying to put them on and people, patients or people complaining about them and, and just thoughts on on that for whether it's whether you before you've decided surgical non-surgical uh, either way um, just people faculty maybe thoughts on whether it should be done should not be done because I know there's some faculty that say there's there's no use for it at all uh, and some people that think it there is a use for it yeah I mean I think for me uh, proximal humerus fractures don't get coaptation splints I think proximal humeral shaft Aft fracture, you might be able to, you know, sort of potentially convince me. Uh, but for me, you know, proximal humerus fracture, regardless of how displaced or how many parts or how much combination, go into a sling. Generally speaking, these patients don't stay in the hospital after their ED visit. They can go home, and then I see them in clinic, and then we have a talk. You know, what's the optimal treatment uh, for these patients? Now, obviously, the ones that are dislocated, that might be a little bit different, but. I think we've gone at least for most of our, or if not all of our patients that have these in the ED is really uh, sling. Uh, and then, um, you know, 
just kind of have the discussion about what the next steps are. And, and again, I, I want to stress, although this is uh, the whole talk was about reverse shoulder for treatment, uh, the vast majority of the patients coming in have minimally to no, non-displaced fractures and are getting non-operative treatment. Uh, so I think, you know, putting them in a splint or anything like that is probably unnecessary. Uh, so something like a sling is good. And then just range of motion for the elbow, wrist and hand is tolerated. Um, and then just kind of following up with them in clinic uh, over the next sort of maybe seven to 10 days. Dr. Clavino um, also commented, great talk. His question was, what are the activity limitations after re reverse shoulder arthroplasty for proximal humerus fracture? Yeah, so I think, uh, and I think, I don't know if Jason's on, I know we have sort of a slightly similar ways to do it. We kind of protect the tuberosities immediately after uh, to get them to heal because like those talks or like the, the, those papers showed, if the tuberosities heal, patients tend to do better. So my way of doing this is about, I protect the patients for the first four to six weeks uh, with no active assisted range of motion of the, uh, the shoulder, but I allow them to use their arm as sort of waist level. Um, and then after that, uh, I get an x-ray and if it looks like it's healing nicely uh, or hasn't displaced yet, then I let them start to do active assisted range of motion. Uh, and then sort of longer term, sort of what you're probably asking is, do we, you know, let patients go back to manual labor or things like that? And I think the answer is ideally no. And, you know, you can come up with a weight bearing limit or, a you know, you can't lift more than 20 pounds or 40 pounds or whatever. You know, the problem is just like uh, O'Driscoll showed for the total elbow is there's a 0% chance of them, uh, you know, adhering to those things. And so I tell people to make smart decisions. I say, the more you use it, the more you'll potentially wear it down. Um, but if, you know, you use it within reason, it's probably going to be okay. And it's just like a fast, you know, shiny new car. If they, uh, you know, speed and, and up and brake at every intersection, they'll use the brakes, they'll use the tires faster um, than if not. And if they, you know, sort of manage it a little bit more then you can still be, be driving that 30 year old car around and, and, it, and having it looking good. So while I don't really limit them per se, I try to tell them to avoid certain activities uh, especially sort of repeated uh, lifting overhead with heavy weights. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I have patients that go bowling, uh, you know, maybe they, they use the smaller balls instead of the big balls. And, and I have patients who go golfing and I have patients who do all these things. And, you know, probably the ones that want to parachute uh, out of a plane, probably not a great idea. Uh, but otherwise, I think, you know, you kind of, you kind of have a discussion with the patient and put it on them. I, I have um, Dr. Matson um, said very convincing presentation, and uh, he said it reminds us of the use of total elbow arthroplasty for elbow fractures in el in the elderly. Any thoughts on the relative value of the different implant designs for reverse shoulders? Yeah, maybe Corey, I'll take this one. So, um, you know. The different implant designs that Dr. Madsen is referring to is, uh, you know, the onlay system versus an inlay system, which is more of a classic uh, uh, implant uh, for the, the reverse shoulder, thinking about how much distalization and also how much lateralization. So there's different implants with regards to the glenosphere. And what we know is this puts a lot more tension on uh, the, the chromium if you lateralize and distalize. And so there's probably a sweet spot and, and the newer literature shows that, you know, probably 140 or 135 degree implant is more um, beneficial to these patients and not over uh, lateralizing and over distalizing. And so coming up with sort of an implant that is uh, in between lateralizing enough to tension the soft tissue, but not, not too much and putting these in slightly looser than uh, we may have done, you know, 20 years ago, will avoid the complications of uh, a chromial fracture or stress fracture. And by repairing the tuberosities, uh, if you over distalize, we know that it can be difficult to repair the tuberosities. So probably uh, doing that a little bit less will help tuberosities heal. That in turn will give you better function and that'll give you uh, more stability. So I think that would be the answer something that doesn't distalize or lateralize too much, but sort of in that sweet spot. And we may not have found it yet perfectly, but I think we're getting there. I have a question. 
Um, I was surprised on that um, last radiograph you showed that you use so little cement. Of course, if you ever have to revise these and you have whiteout, um, it's just incredibly um, challenging. But you're also missing, you know, that nice solid proximal humerus to help control rotation of the humeral prosthesis. And so I assume that the uh, um, common mode of failure for these is not loosening of the humeral component. Yeah, it isn't. Uh, the one thing that it maybe didn't come out very well because you're sort of we're going into detail, but if there's not a lot of proximal humerus um, metaphysis or the the neck isn't available, <clears throat> then I will impaction graft uh, to kind of build the canal back up a little bit and then cement. And really what I'm trying to do with the cement is prevent rotational deformity and subsidence. So because these stems are usually double tapered at the top, if you kind of create a cone of cement that can't really subside and uh, fits around those fins, because a lot of the fracture stems have fins for uh, the this, this suture, you really will prevent subsidence and you'll get the rotational stability. But man, it's a lot easier to revise that stem if you don't have to take out, you know, do an extended osteotomy. So I haven't seen uh, those, those subside um, or, or fail in that mechanism if you're, if you're putting that kind of cement. But again, I'm, I'm not cementing maybe less than 30%, even in the older patients. I found that, you know, if there's that neck available, really what I do is just impact the stem right up into the inferior neck. And then it's against cortical bone and it really can't subside uh, at all at that point. And so really, I've been quite satisfied with that. I know we have quite a few of the trauma and, and um, upper extremity surgeons um, still, still on. Any, any other questions or comments? <clears throat> um, Dr. Ku is asking, what is your algorithm for young active patients with significant three or four, four pipe fractures? Um, in these patients, do you ever opt for reverse shoulder arthroplasty? Uh, so I think the answer is no. I try to be very judicious with the use of uh, reverse shoulder and uh, young patients get fixation uh, because, you know, I think if you can get the tuberosities to heal in a 40 year old or, a, you know, 45 year old or even 55 year old and the, they go on to AVN, I, you know, I, I still think that a well done total shoulder arthroplasty with good rotator cuff will give them better function uh, you know, they can probably get near total function, whereas a reverse shoulder in a 50 year old probably won't give them the same type of outcome that they want. And so I, I tend, at least for me, I know that some people across the country have been doing them in patients that are younger and younger, but I tend to sort of uh, my, 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 you know, it's not a hard line in the sand, but I think 60 plus is starting to be a good sort of gauge of when to to do these uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasties. Excellent questions. Any, anybody else? We still have um, 40 people hanging in there who haven't uh, gone to clinic or the OR yet. I think, I think that is it. Well, well, thank you. That was, there's, you see the comments uh, piling up um, in the chat area and that, that was fantastic. Uh, I certainly, learned a lot and it was a very convincing presentation. Um, I hope everybody has a great day and great week and um, happy uh, 2021. And I learned during Grand Rounds today that it's actually uh, Dr. Walker's 31st birthday. So um, happy birthday, uh, Greg, uh, vir virtual uh, clap for you. So everybody uh, take care, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.